which is harder to predict, a coin flip or a die roll? With a coin, there are two outcomes. With a die, there are six. Both are random, but the die feels less predictable. That is our intuition. The real question is this, can we put a number on that feeling of uncertainty? In 1948, a young engineer and mathematician named Claude Shannon published a groundbreaking paper titled A Mathematical Theory of Communication. In it, he asked a deceptively simple question. How do we measure information? And how should communication systems be built around that measurement? Those pages became the birth certificate of information theory. Every text message you send, every video call you make, every file you download, even the very video you're watching right now, all descend from the ideas first laid out in that paper. Before we reveal the formula, let us try to invent a measure of uncertainty ourselves and see why the obvious ideas are not enough. Naive idea number one, count outcomes. At first glance, this seems the most obvious. A fair coin has two outcomes. A die has six outcomes. Clearly six is bigger than two, so the die feels more uncertain. That matches our intuition, at least for a moment. But then consider a biased coin. Suppose it lands heads 90% of the time and tails only 10%. It still technically has two outcomes, just like the fair coin. But is the uncertainty really the same? Of course not. The biased coin is almost entirely predictable. Counting outcomes completely ignores the fact that probabilities can be lopsided. In other words, it can't tell the difference between a balanced system and one where the answer is practically predetermined. Naive idea number two, take the largest probability. So maybe instead of counting outcomes, we measure uncertainty by looking at the largest probability in the distribution. That seems reasonable. For a fair coin, the largest probability is 0.5. For a biased coin, it might be 0.9. Larger probability means more predictability. Smaller probability means less predictability. That does reflect something real. But now try a die. The maximum probability is 1 sixth, which is about 0.16. According to this rule, the die should be far more uncertain than the coin, and that does sound okay. But push it further. Imagine a 20-sided die with maximum probability 1 20th, or 0 0.05. Does that mean the die is somehow 10 times more uncertain than a coin flip? That scaling feels completely wrong. This measure doesn't tell us how uncertainty grows in a natural way as the number of outcomes increases. Naive idea number three, use variance of the probabilities. Another idea might be variance. Variance is a measure of spread, and uncertainty seems related to how spread out probabilities are. If one outcome dominates, variance is small, and uncertainty is small. If probabilities are evenly spread, variance is larger, and maybe uncertainty is larger. It seems like a plausible candidate. But variance fails a much more subtle test. Consider combining experiments. Flip a coin, then roll a die. You could treat this as two separate random steps, or you could treat it as one experiment with 12 possible outcomes. A good measure of uncertainty should give consistent results either way. If you add the uncertainty of the coin and the die separately, you should get the same number as if you measured the 12 outcome system directly. Variance doesn't do that. The numbers just don't line up, and that inconsistency shows us it's not the right tool. So we need principles. Shannon started from three simple requirements for any sensible measure of uncertainty. Requirement one, continuity. Small changes in probabilities should not produce huge jumps in uncertainty, otherwise the measure is unusable. Requirement two, maximum at the uniform distribution. When all outcomes are equally likely, unpredictability is greatest. As the distribution becomes skewed, uncertainty should go down. Requirement three, consistency or additivity. If you flip a coin and roll a die, you can treat them separately or as one 12 outcome event. A proper measure must give the same total either way. For independent events, uncertainty should add. These rules are not arbitrary. 
They prevent contradictions and force the measure into a very specific shape. Let us test the uniform case. Suppose outcomes are equally likely. A coin has two, a die has six, two dice have 36. What function should measure uncertainty here? Think of a game of questions. I pick one item out of a set and you ask yes or no questions to find it. With four equally likely options, like letters A, B, C, and D, you can ask, is it an A or B? If yes, ask, is it A? If no, ask, is it C? That always takes two questions. With eight options, you need three questions. With 16, you need four. Every time the number of outcomes doubles, the number of questions increases by exactly one. That growth rule is exactly the logarithm base 2. Logarithm base 2 of 4 equals 2. Logarithm base 2 of 8 equals 3. Logarithm base 2 of 16 equals 4. The logarithm is the only function that turns multiplication of possibilities into addition of questions. It is also what fixes the additivity requirement. For example, if you roll two dice, there are 36 possible outcomes. Logarithm base 2 of 36 equals logarithm base 2 of 6 plus logarithm base 2 of 6. The coin plus die example also works. 12 outcomes total. Logarithm base 2 of 12 equals logarithm base 2 of 2 plus logarithm base 2 of 6. The logarithm is not a trick. It is required by the structure of yes or no splits. This brings us to the unit. Each yes or no question is one unit of information. And this is where Shannon gave the unit its famous name. In his paper, he writes about the term bit, short for binary digit. The word was already being used informally around Bell Labs, but Shannon's 1948 paper made it the official standard. So when we say that a fair coin flip carries one bit of information, we mean it takes exactly one yes or no question to determine the outcome. Let us use the ABCD game to see both the uniform and the skewed cases as decision trees. Uniform ABCD, A, B, C, and D each occur 25% of the time. A perfectly balanced tree asks two questions and stops. The average depth is exactly two, which matches logarithm of four. Skewed ABCD. Now suppose A appears 50%, D appears 25%, and B and C appear 12.5% each. A good decision tree is, ask, is it A? If yes, stop, depth 1. If no, ask, is it D? If yes, stop, depth 2. If no, split B and C, depth 3 for both. The expected number of questions then can be calculated like this. So on average, we need 1.75 yes or no questions to identify the letter. That average depth is what we want our measure to capture. Why does the logarithm still appear when probabilities are skewed? Because each leaf's surprise should depend on how rare it is. And the only function that plays nicely with splitting and additivity is the logarithm. This is where Shannon introduces information content, or surprisal. If an event is certain, p equals 1, then i equals 0, no surprise. If p equals 1 half, i equals 1. If p equals 1 over 1,000, i is about 10. Rare events carry more information. Now take the expected surprise before the experiment happens. That is the uncertainty of the source. This is entropy. Entropy H equals minus the sum over all outcomes of P of X times the logarithm base two of P of X. Check a few cases. A fair coin gives H equals one. A biased coin with 90% and 10% gives h about 0 
Our skewed ABCD example gives H about 1.75 to 2 decimals, matching the decision tree average. At this point, Shannon had a formula but not a name. He asked John von Neumann for advice. Von Neumann said, call it entropy. First, the term already exists in statistical mechanics. Second, no one really knows what entropy is, so in a debate, you will always have the advantage. Shannon originally wrote the symbol using the Greek letter eta for entropy. In print, it became H, and that convention stuck. Why this formula and not some other clever idea? Shannon proved that if you accept just three simple rules, continuity, maximum at the uniform distribution, and additivity, then there is only one possible measure of uncertainty. It has to be this entropy formula, apart from a constant factor that depends on the choice of the logarithm base. And once you choose base 2, the natural unit becomes the bit. So what does entropy do for us? Compression. Entropy gives the absolute lower bound on average code length for any lossless compression of a source. If a source has entropy 2.5 bits per symbol, then no compressor can reduce the long-run average below 2.5 bits per symbol. You can approach the bound with optimal prefix codes or arithmetic coding, but you cannot beat it. Error correction. Entropy tells us how much redundancy we must add to survive noise. The noisier the channel, the more extra bits are needed to protect the message, and the limits are expressed in terms of entropies. Cryptography and randomness. High entropy means unpredictability. Keys with low entropy are guessable. Keys with high entropy resist brute force and guessing attacks. Let us close by returning to the original question. Which is harder to predict, a coin or a die? The answer is now measured, not just felt. The coin carries one bit of uncertainty. The die carries log base 2 of 6 bits, about 2.58. For any distribution, the uncertainty is h, the average number of yes or no questions you need to identify the outcome. Claude Shannon did not just invent a clever formula. He gave us a ruler for the invisible. Information is surprise. Entropy is expected surprise. And the lower bound for lossless compression is the entropy itself. You can get close. You can never go lower. That is the mathematics behind our digital world.